Hey everybody, I am Kevin Ioli and welcome to Yahoo Sports and my guest now is a very familiar face not only for his commentary that he does a great job uh, on ESPN but also he is the UFC welterweight champion in the world on February 13th Kamaru Usman will be defending his title against a good buddy of his Gilbert Burns uh, at UFC 258 here in Las Vegas Nevada. Kamaru, how's it going pal? It's going amazing, how are you? I am doing very, very good. Excited. Um, you know, your fight is uh, a lot different than, I guess, some of your last ones. Uh, Colby Covington at UFC 245, kind of a bitter enemy feud type thing. Masvidal uh, in the summer uh, on Fight Island. Uh, now you're going in with a guy that you've, according to Gilbert, you've sparred over 200 rounds with. You were teammates, you were friends. Uh, how does that change the uh, the way the fight goes? Uh, is there any? Is it make it any more difficult because you guys are buddies? Um, no, it doesn't really change it. it it's um, I'd say it's, this is a little different. More this is a little dif different with the background, but it doesn't change anything when we when it comes time for fight time. Mm -hmm. you know, by the time I get in there, I, I, I see no face, and I don't care about that. Um, you know, in a sense, it was diff it's different than the other, the last two or three fights, but in a different way, it's similar. You know, by the time we get in there, it, it would be similar because there's a lot of, there's just a, there's just a different driving, motivating factor here in this fight. But, you know, at the end of the day, no, nothing is different. When we get in there, I, I see no face and uh, I have to get in there and get my job done. You, you did a great job both against Colby and against uh, Jorge uh, of controlling your emotions. And I think sometimes, you know, we saw it with Jose Aldo, a, a veteran fighter against Conor McGregor, who, you know, when they fought, when the bell sounded, he wanted to kill, you know, Conor. I mean, he wanted to take Conor's head off and he walked uh, right into a, a Conor left hand. And I, you know, I wonder from your standpoint, like, you know, is that something that just came naturally being able to, you know, put all that stuff behind you? Or was there something you had to work on? Did you get emotional when you first started? No, it's something that I, I had to work on, and uh, I have a great, uh, a great support system. I have great guys that I, I, I lean on. You know, uh, I've, I've, over and over, I've said it that I, I'm classically trained, and, and and what I mean by that is the fact that you know I've learned from some of the best that have ever done it. You know, when you grow up, when you grow up in the sport, and you're 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 looking up and you're watching guys like Rashad Evans, guys like Eddie Alvarez, and and, and and all these guys and how they do it and how they navigate through, you know, it gives you a better insight because as we all know, uh, experience is the best teacher. So when these guys have experienced it and they're telling you how to go about certain things and you start feeling those emotions as well, I have an upper hand now. And plus it doesn't hurt that, you know, years and years of competing and wrestling has kind of shaped me and molded me into being able to control it. But don't get it wrong. At the end of the day, I still want to kill these guys. That, right. that's not, that's not, that doesn't go away. It's just, I'm more calculated and I'm just better at it than, than all these guys. Were you happy, you know, when you look back on it now, it's what, eight months uh, since, since you fought Masvidal, were you happy with that performance? I mean, you take them on short notice, you win every round going away. Uh, you know, there's some school of thought that maybe you were going to be able to finish him because he didn't have a, a full camp. How, how would you assess your performance there? No, I think he definitely had a full camp. You know, it, it's it, there was a built-in excuse for him to take that fight on the short notice. But at the end of the day, I risked everything. I was the champion. And I risked that title and everything like that, especially with all the hype and all the hoopla that was coming with him, saying that he was going to baptize me, he was going to do this, he was going to do that. You know, I risked it all. A guy says he's going to baptize you, you know, you get, a little, you get a little tight, you get a little scared about it. But... You know, I risked my time. I said, you know what? I don't care whether it's six days, whether it's six months, whether it's six weeks. I don't give a damn. I'm still going to get in there and I can beat you with tools that I've had 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I did do that. So at the end of the day, yeah, a win is a win. You know, had I gone out there and lost, this would be a different conversation we're having here. Right. So absolutely, you know, uh, I'm always happy with the win because that's the objective. If winning wasn't important, then they wouldn't keep score. They wouldn't be judges sitting right there. So, you know, yeah, of course, I'm happy with it. Being able to walk away with that, you know, I won every round, you know, basically not even close and I didn't even, you know, have to dig deep into the toolbox to get that one done. So, yeah, of course. 
you are 17 and one with a 16 fight winning streak, including 12 in a row in the UFC. And that might be the most amazing thing. You know, you're in a really tough division and you, and you fought a lot of good guys. And I think as I was looking at your record while we were waiting to do this interview, you know, it's even a little better than you think, because like a long ago, you fought guys like Sean Strickland who were starting to come out and, you know, guys that maybe at the time weren't regarded as, you know, these elite players. But you look back on it, um, you know, when you look at your run in the UFC, what do you attribute all that success to? Because, you know, guy, you mentioned guys before, Eddie Alvarez, great fighter, uh, lightweight champion, Rashad Evans, you know, Hall of Famer. But they've all lost and they've lost multiple times. You've managed to avoid that. What do you attribute that success to? I attribute it to, to really listening and, and, and taking what they say to heart. You know, when they say this is what you do to try to avoid this situation, then, you know, I try to do that, you know, and, and also I attribute it to uh, early on, you know, these guys poured into me that you take it one fight at a time. I remember after I lost my second professional fight, I was so eager to, to get back in there, but um, I was, I was, um, very, I remember the moment I was very, I, I got on sure dog for the first time. Um, and I, I saw like these records, I saw Rashad Evans' record. And at one point Rashad went on a crazy tear, like just, you know, killing everybody and just win, 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 win. And I'm like, man, I'm one and one facing going into my third professional fight. I'm scared because that was eight months ago that I had to live with this loss. And what if I lose again? What if, you know, and I was scared with about that. But the whole time I look at Rashad's record, I see all these wins, I see all these fights, and I'm like, man, one day, I, I, how do I get to that one day? How do I, that's a lot of fights. Like, how am I going to get there one day? I'm one and one, and I've just lost my last one. I don't know if I can do it. And they just told me, you know, take it one fight at a time. One fight at a time. And I think the, the, the next time I subconsciously actually, like, I, I really looked at my record. I was five and one in the ultimate fighter finality and should be seven and one, but right, I was correct. five yeah. and one. Yeah. And, um, and I'm like, wow, now I, I got six fights. It's not one and one anymore. I got six fights. Well, we'll see. I, I'm looking at guys like George St. Pierre and they've got tons of fights. I'm like, man, how do I get there? Next thing you know, people are telling me, Hey, you're 16 and one, you're going to fight Island to defend this. I'm like, wow, how did those, I rack up these fights that quickly, you know? And that was basically because I wasn't looking ahead. I was taking it one fight at a time. And when you do it one fight at a time, at the end of the day, you're going to be sitting on the Mount Rushmore of the sport saying, man, I got all those fights in me. And, and I didn't even, I wasn't looking ahead. I wasn't looking too far ahead. I, I just took them one fight at a time. You, um, you know, you're an ultimate fighter winner, but I would say that you didn't have this high profile coming into the UFC, even though, you know, by definition, winning the ultimate fighter, you're a high profile, but you know, it seems like, you know, you came from Nigeria, you wrestled at division two people didn't, you know, they weren't looking at you like at the time. And I guess we've learned differently. Nigeria wasn't considered an MMA hotbed, right? So you know, there are not a lot of great uh, fighters coming out of Nigeria uh, before you and uh, Israel Adesanya. Um, but I guess what about, you know, your notoriety, like now you sold over a million pay-per-views on your last fight. All of a sudden now you're getting there and this is where the money comes in, having that notoriety. You got the microphone where you're on television occasionally and you're, you're talking about the sport. Do you feel like now you're ready to cash in? You're at the point in your life and in your professional career where you can do what so many other fighters have done, you know, and, and make the big money and kind of take it to that next level. Of course, <laughs> I think, um, you know, um, when opportunity knocks, you just, you just got to take it. And, um, you know, of course, we're, we're in a difficult time right now in the world to where it's, you know, we're just, everyone's just trying to get by. Everyone's find, trying to find a way to survive. And, and that's kind of how the sport is. And, you know, we're, we're extremely thankful that Dana was able to, to fight through this and, and continue to put fights on so people can actually feed their families. So that's not something that we take for granted at all. But at the end of the day, the goal is always to be able to cash in. And, and part of doing that is, is, you know, I have a whole country, not just a country, I have a, a continent that, that looks up to me, that looks up to uh, uh, guys like Israel and, and guys like Francis Ngannou and, and Sadiq Yusuf and, and, and all these other guys that are in, in the game. They look up to us. And as a trailblazer, it, it is, it's, partially my responsibility 
to be able to take the sport there and really show them like, look at what we did. And we're just, we're just maybe five or six guys in the UFC. Imagine when you open it up to, let's just say Nigeria, where it's 200 million people, you know, at the end of the day, once we get it there, you know, my opportunity will come where, you know, of course I will be able to cash in and, uh, and, and, and get out. And, you know, as a, as a grandpa looking at my grandkids and say, yeah, we did that. And that's why we, we live where we live. Do you think, um, you know, because of your race that you, it, it took your stardom to come slower? Because, you know, you look at it and there's no hint of scandal around you. You won fights with the exception of the one time when you made the comment that Dana did not like. You know, there's never been anything kind of negative around you. And yet, you know, you you weren't a guy on that front burner. You know, you didn't hear people pushing Kamaru Usman a lot. Uh, and I wonder, you know, do you feel like that was a racial thing? And do you think it takes longer for uh, black fighters to make it in the sport than it does for white fighters? Um, I, I, I've honestly, um, it, it's interesting that you say that, you know, because part of that is, um, you know, like, yeah, there's, there's nothing I didn't, I'm not, I was, I, I, I was raised right. And I, that's what I attribute that to, to where, no, I, I'm not, I'm not, you know, shooting up cocaine in a hotel or, or, or doing some crazy or beating my wife to the point where I'm in the media for all these negative things. Nowadays, it's all about just clicks. It's all about being in the media, whether it's good, bad, or no one cares, you know, and I was just not that guy. Right. I was raised to the point where, you know, it's a response that you have a responsibility to pay it forward. That's how my dad was, you know, I wouldn't want to do something that I don't want to see my kids doing. I wouldn't want to do that because right. at, at that point, is that me being a good parent? Is that me setting a good example? And so, of course, that's boring. People don't want to see that, especially nowadays. People just want to be entertained. They don't care if it's, if it's crazy, if it's wrong. If it, it's, people don't care about that. Why do people laugh when we see someone slip and fall and get hurt? You know, people just want to be entertained in the way. They don't care in what manner that they're entertained. Right. And the fact that I continuously don't want to have to be that guy in order to maybe get clicks or get this. Hey, if they like it, they like it. At the end of the day, they will look back on my body of work and say, maybe we didn't appreciate this guy enough right. and all that he's done. You know, one thing I asked you this before, but I'm going to ask you it again, um, because, you know, you've had injuries and you haven't always been the healthiest guy. And um, several people said this to me, but your your manager, uh, Ali Abdelaziz, has said it multiple times and it stuck with me. He said, this guy is only scratching the surface of how good he really is and that if he was ever fully healthy for a fight, you would be shocked at what you see. When are we going to see is it what Ali Abdelaziz and so many other people talk about and this Usman get in the cage and, and be this monster that they describe? Not that you aren't already, but you know what I'm saying. I don't, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know because at the end of the day, um, when you get out there, you know, things just happen. And obviously you try to be in a, as a much of control of what's going on out there as you can, but things happen. And uh, it, it's very rare that some like I'm able to defeat these guys just using my mind to right. where it, it's not, you know, a lot of people love to see the back and forth wars and things of that nature, but I'm beating guys, you know, 50, 43, 50, 44, like I, without even having to go to that aspect. And that's not me scratching the surface yet. That goes to tell you how far above these guys that I am. Had, had Am I able to do that? It's, it's, I'm, I'm hope I want to see that myself. It, I'll be, I'll be, I blow my own mind away. Being that would put you on Habib level, right? Yeah. Blow my own mind away. Being able to really see that, you know, but it, you know, certain athletes, they're going to bring out certain things in you. And, and then we saw in the, in the, in the Covington fight, you know, he brought out a, a different type of fighter in, in me and, you know, it's up to those guys. If they step up and they, they did their homework and they come with their A game, then I got to dig a little deeper in the toolbox and, and, and really expose certain things that they've never seen. I want to ask you a couple more questions here. And one of them about your coach, Trevor Whitman, who uh, I've known for a long time from boxing and, you know, and he's really uh, emerged as a, one of the better MMA coaches out there. Now you've had a, you know, a, a lengthy time uh, with him in camp. And I'm just curious, you know, kind of, you know, what your thought is on, on his MMA uh, approach to the game and what, what uh, you think he's added to your uh, arsenal. Yeah, Trevor, Trevor's an amazing coach. Um, 
you know, when I was wanted to, when I wanted to make the transition out, and I was really breaking down the coaches that I wanted to work with. Uh, you know, I wanted guys like 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 Trevor, like and, and these are guys that that really like are indulged, that are engulfed in the sport, to where they think about this the whole time, the way their mind works. Like, like Trevor Whitman, Mark Henry, uh, you know, these are the guys that I kind of narrowed it down to because their mind works similar because they're they're in this with you and just the way that Trevor approaches the game the way that he he builds you from the foundation up you know he wants to make sure that we're not missing a beat he wants to make sure that all the bases are covered when it's time to go in there in the fight and um and of course it, it, it helps when you know his base is boxing and and my base is wrestling because now with those two combined, it, it makes for a very violent and uh, uh, a dangerous combination. That is awesome. Now, Gilbert obviously is a really dangerous guy with the jujitsu and everything else he has. He's on a great winning streak. I mean, he destroyed Woodley like you did. Uh, I didn't think anybody was going to be able to do that to Woodley again after you did, and he did it. You know, So I give him a lot of credit uh, for what he did. But I want to ask you this about him. You trained with him when he wasn't so successful. You saw him when you saw – I'm sure you saw the talent in the gym, and he wasn't putting it on as often in the, in the uh, octagon. What do you think changed to make Gilbert, you know, from – just a good fighter into this, you know, a machine who's now risen to the uh, top of the welterweight division. Yeah, he's still a good fighter. You know, even back then, I, I thought he was a good fighter, which he still is now. Um, it's, you know, when you're in the gym with someone and, uh, and they see everything that you're doing and they see how you're becoming successful, you know, you tend to mimic that. It's like, okay, that's what that guy that's successful, that's what he's doing. I need to do that in order to, to get there. You know, I did it. Tons, tons of people have done it. And, uh, you know, when you've got a champion in your gym and you watch what the champion is doing and the champion's telling you do this, do this, and do this, it'll help you improve in this way. And you start to see, you know, small improvements and you start to see overall improvements. Yeah, of course you're going to buy into that. You know, and, and yeah, of course that, that was great for him. You know, being able to have a champion in the gym that he can look at and say, yo, that's what you're doing. That's what's getting you there all right, I'm going to mimic that. So he's done that, you know, but at the end of the day, you can't forget that the champion is still doing that. And the champion has been doing that. So, you know, February 13th, we'll, we'll see how that, that all comes together. So the old uh, line, I taught, I taught him all he knows, but I didn't teach him all I know. Right. Is that, is that where you're getting at? <laughs> You said it, not me, but you're not far <laughs> off. <laughs> one, one last thing, and, we'll, and I'll let you get out of here. Thank you, Kamaru, uh, is, is this. Uh, given that you know each other so well, is there a possibility that there's going to be a stalemate? Because, you, know, you know, you've trained, you know, he says over 200 rounds. You know, that seems like a lot, but let's say that's accurate. Uh, you know what he does. He knows what you do. Is there a possibility of being a stalemate, or how do you, how do you think you break out of that and, and put on a show for the people? Impossible. With me, it's impossible to, to be a stalemate because, um, you know, all I know is to go and, and get the work done. Um, I, I've, I've, I've had many times, many attempts to, to figure that out all throughout my collegiate wrestling career and, and amateur wrestling career is when you, knowing how to, when you come to a stalemate and when you don't perform. And I've corrected that. So no, there's no possibility for that because at the end of the day, my hand's going to be raised. And in order for me to get my hand raised, I need to do my job. So that's what I'm going to do February 13th. That is the champ, Kamaru Usman. As he said, February 13th, UFC 250 in the small cage at the Apex in Las Vegas, Nevada. You will see him against Gilbert Burns. Should be a good one. Kamaru, thank you so much for the time and always good to talk to you. All the best to you. Thank you, Kevin.